Hello and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. This week, I'm taking you to Africa to meet a man who's dedicated his life to conservation and showed unwavering dedication and passion for protecting black rhinos in Namibia's northwest. Simpson Urikob is CEO of Save the Rhino Trust Namibia and has been working for the Trust for 30 years, protecting rhinos from poaching, which has swept the continent, and preserving their habitat. From 1960 to 1995, black rhino numbers dropped by a sobering 98%, and it's thought there are fewer than 6,000 left today. I met Simpson for the first time a few weeks ago, backstage at the prestigious Tusk Awards, and felt compelled to tell his story. He was at the British Film Institute in London to receive Tusk's royal patron, Prince William's Lifetime Award for Conservation in Africa from His Royal Highness himself. Here's a short excerpt of a special moment we captured with the Duke and Simpson behind the scenes. Oh, well, I'm obviously deeply thrilled and honoured and proud that Simpson's got chosen. I mean, he was, I I met him a few years ago and uh, you can have a certain eye for people and you think he's got to win one day. And I'm so glad that the judges have deemed this year to be the fit year that um, that Simpson wins. I think he's done a phenomenal job and I'm, I'm just so pleased for him. I'll share more later in the podcast. I'm delighted to say Simpson is joining me now. Simpson, it's so good to have you with us. We've never actually done a podcast in Africa, which is great. And I'm guessing Namibia feels a bit warmer than London did last month. Oh, yes. Namibia is very hot. I mean, right now we're running in the 40s, 43, 44. And I mean, I really enjoyed being in London for those 10 days and it was nice and cool. Yeah, it, it was really nice and cool. And um, it makes a difference coming out from Africa, from Namibia, especially where it's so hot to London and suddenly feel this nice cold breeze. I'm sure the cold was a little bit of a relief after the incredible temperatures you get there. Simpson, when I shook your hand after the Tusk ceremony, I just knew I wanted to hear more about you and your extraordinary work. Tell us how you got involved with conservation and rhino in the first place. My trade actually is the electrician, but I am a man of all trades. I can do welding, vehicle maintenance and so on. So what happened actually was right from the beginning as a little boy, I, I like conservation. I like wildlife and all those kind of things. I didn't have the chance to really do it. But now the one day Blythe Flutit, who was the founder director of Save the Rhinos, the Rhino Trust, she passed away. She actually came to me on a Sunday. She said, you know, it's, it's Sunday and no garages will help me today. Otherwise, they will charge me a lot of money. So would you please be able to come and help me to fix this one car of mine that's broken in the field? I fixed the car for her. It was fine. Two weeks later, she came again and she had a, a Land Rover that she, she wanted me to fix for her, do some reinforcement and put rails up for her so that she could load stuff on the car. So I did this for her and that was fine. She went away and then she came again and she asked me, but I, I think I, I wanted to give you a job, not a well-paid job because we don't have money, but still if you can become the supervisor of the trust, supervising the guys that's doing the building on the elephant protection dams in the communal area within the communities. I said, no, that's fine. I can do that. And a while later, I had to go and fix a vehicle in the field that belongs to the rhino team that was doing the patrolling. So I went and fixed the vehicle and I spent some time just decided to stay with them around there. The first day we went out, we tracked a rhino cow and a car we found them, and the guys actually told me, sometimes these animals charge. So now you must choose a tree and stay next to a big tree. So when she charge, you just climb up in the tree a little bit higher, and it's fine. She will do nothing to you. So I was standing next to this tree, and this cow, she was breastfeeding. But then suddenly she turned around, and then she decided she's coming for us. And I just climbed in the tree, and I stopped there. And here she stopped like a few meters away from me, and I was watching and in her face, and I said, ooh. What a big animal, what a nice animal. I watched her for a while and then she turned around and ran off. We followed the other days. We went out, we found some more animals, find more rhinos. And I enjoy the guys doing this trekking. And then the last night when I spent with them, I said, guys, I think I'm leaving this building, monitoring things. And I'm coming and joining you guys doing this for the rest of my life. I really enjoy it. I 
went back. I told Blythe, I really want to work with the, with the Rhino guys now. She said, okay, you can go out with the teams. And I went out in the south, Doros area, with, with the one team, which I really like all the guys. They were very good and honest, and they teach me a lot of things. We worked together for so long, and it was fun all the time to go out to the field, find these animals, record the data, bring the data back to the office and follow up in the computer on all the things. It was really nice. Gosh, it sounds amazing. And that's your first time that you saw a rhino. What a special moment. It's not always full of highs though, Simpson, is it? And when you joined the trust in the early 90s, it was at the height of poaching, I suppose. Yeah. When I joined Save the Rhino Trust in the 90s, actually, poaching just stopped and things get better. We started working on more teams, more fundraising, build up the whole trust. I become the director of field operations and we were really doing amazing things. And I mean, we had like four or five teams now and we were working very hard. We did a proper rhino census to know how many animals were there. And that was in 1995 that we, we did this. And we started with a rhino data base in 95 that was developed by uh, Dr. Rob Brett who's a very experienced uh, person in conservation and he's one of my mentors actually. I met him while I was in London. So he actually developed the database for us that we are working on until today and it's so good. On the other hand, I also worked for a little while with elephant and I had the privilege of being sent to Kenya to do a course on elephant behavior sexing and all those kind of things. And I work again with a lady called Cynthia Moss, who was the elephant lady. And she taught me quite a lot about elephants. And when I came back to Namibia, I was actually the first accredited elephant trainer that could train the people in the conservancies and MET people, Minister of Wildlife and Tourism people. And I mean, I trained so many people how to work with elephants and how to approach elephants look at their behavior and all those kind of things. But then I decided my, my patron is in, in Rhino. So I swept away again to Rhinos and I worked with the teams. I was actually deploying the guys in the field, but as a person like and love the Rhinos of the field, I went out on my own with a team every time. And my favorite team was actually the then camel team that we had, where I could ride on a camel or a donkey on patrol. And then I just park the vehicle. So I will spend like three weeks with the guys in the field, tracking rhinos on the camels and with the donkeys and enjoy it. I learned quite a lot from the guys, all kinds of field techniques and how to harvest field food. And if I didn't have food, how to survive from field food and all those kind of things. I had good mentors actually that's not there today who passed away. They were the two mentors that actually taught me everything to the fullest. So my life in the field and with rhinos and all the other game, I think is the best. That sounds the best to me. I've never actually seen animals at all in the wild. That's terrible. That's something I'm going to sort next year. But let's talk rhinos, Simpson. And how well do you know the rhinos? Helen, I know my rhinos. I mean, after 30 years, the number we have had is actually, I'm not allowed to give numbers and distributions out, but I mean, when the poaching started, we had just over 200 animals in the Northwest region. But it wasn't just the poaching that decreased the numbers. It's also the severe drought that we had for years in our region that actually also touched the rhinos. But I know them because we have to go out every day when I was with the teams. We found the animals, we follow them, we found them, we record them, and they've got names, they've got codes, and so on. So every rhino in the database has, has got a, a name and code where we worked on to her. Breeding females, it goes like what we call the family tree, where you record all the calves as they come every year. And by doing this, we know all our rhinos by name, by code, by area. Even the fountains where they're drinking, we know exactly. Linda is drinking here and Maduri is drinking there. So we know all the springs where they are and, and where they are distributed. What are some of the most special moments for you in the wild, Simpson? Is being out with my staff, watching rhinos interacting in the field. It's not always that you get rhinos 
especially in our region in the northwest where it's it's a hard big desert it's very tough animals have to move for long distances to get to water and long distances to get to food but if you are lucky and you get four rhinos together in one place it's so nice to sit and watch the interactions that took place there and that's actually our special moments the interaction of the animals different animals that don't stay together all the time just coming together at the water and in the act they talk to each other they put languages that they talk and you can hear them talking and doing things it's so exciting and i would imagine your heart beats a little faster when you see the calves too yeah if you're in a safe place like in a, a top of a hill that's fine but if you low down i mean your heart just beats like bom 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 i mean it's not that we are afraid of them we know how to react if they come to where we are but it's wild animals and you always have to think it's it's wild animals and they can do anything to you but usually they wet they avoid people and they will try and get away from you once when they get your wind they're not very good in sighting but the hearing is very good and the smell is excellent so that's the two things they are actually dependent on and in the area the kunini it's been a difficult 10 years not least because of the severe drought that you've suffered there what impact has that had numbers actually decreased because there was no enough food for the animals some of the springs dried up and we had animals died because of uh, starvation and then the other thing was again the poaching that we had that we experienced from 2012 to 2017 where we actually managed to get ourselves uh, together and and stop the poaching we had control over the poaching for 3 years and then this corona broke out and then the lockdown came in lotches closed down and we must remember tourism actually plays also a very big important role in monitoring because a poacher will not shoot a rhino if they know there is a tourist vehicle in the in the area where they are they will either hide for days and not being seen and so i would say tourism is also actually a help because they are at in places where we are not at the moment and they can save our rhinos by doing so I want to talk a little bit about the poaching and how you combat it Simpson and on what it's like to be out there when you know the poachers are around and see one of the animals that you've worked so hard to protect injured it was very tough when we had the first poaching i was actually on leave with my family and i was far in the south in the east and then i had a phone call one morning and then the guy said rida was shot I said where he said no around the area where she lives and the calf no the calf is still hanging around there I said wow so I just switch off and then tell the family just keep yourself busy here I want to jump on my phone make a few phone calls and arrange some things to happen so it was really sad I mean my wife was asking me like what's wrong I said no one of our rhinos have been poached where I said in the field And so what are you going to do now? Are we going back? I said no, we will not be going back. I'll just get on my phone and I will make some arrangement to get people in places and see what they can do. That was the first incident. And then after that in 2014 it is those terrible. The guys will phone me early in the morning and say we found two very fresh carcasses. I mean the blood is still hot. And I'd say come on guys, this is not going to work. What happened? No, we came across the carcasses and the horns were been chopped off its guys they are not armed because in the past even now our staff the save the rhino staff are not armed with firearms we didn't aim at fighting poaching or poachers with firearms because there was no poaching actually at that time so we were focused mostly on monitoring the animals know where they are the conditions the health and all those kind of things so we didn't really worried about poaching but after this poaching after 2014 2015 we had meetings with the ministry the uh, traditional authorities the communities the namibian police and we decided to say okay now we going to combat this poaching by doing this and this and this so we opened our base our operation hub at palamwah which is the save the rhino trust hub uh, base camp so each month or every 3 months 40 plus police officers will be based there from different regions from Kunene and Erongo 
from different police stations. And they will patrol out in the field with our people, which is two of Save the Rhino Trust people, one community rhino ranger, and one police officer, which is armed. So when we start doing this, actually, poachers realized that things are getting hot in the region, and they moved out. So it was quiet for a while, but they reorganized them again, and they came back. But when they came back in 2017, actually, we were actually a lad already, and we were waiting for them. When we had the information, we sent the police officers out. Everybody was out in the field, and they were waiting at one place where they were supposed to meet with the driver who was waiting for them in a vehicle. And that's how we actually caught those guys. And then it was quiet. So the whole thing was the teamwork that we started with in 2015 by making use of the police, the community rhino rangers, the Ministry of Environment and Tourism staff, and Save the Rhino staff. We had a team that comprised of different people, and they will go out for 20 days, spend time in the field. In the old days, we will patrol with the vehicles, but now these days, when we started to combat poaching, we actually drop off the guys at one point, and they will stay there. From there, they will walk on foot, going up in the mountains, do like uh, sitting there whole day, do observations, because they are higher up, and the poachers will come from the lower ends, from, from the flatter areas. So they can pick them up easily. And even at night, they will spend time there, look for fires that's maybe burning at night, and things, things like that. So that has actually made things difficult for the poachers. And they didn't have a way to come into our area. So they moved to other areas where there were rhinos too. It's unbelievable, isn't it? The demand for yeah. rhino horn and the cruelty and inhumane acts of the poachers. I mean, it sounds like you're doing really well in your area and that you've made massive improvements, but I still can't get the image out of my mind of what these people do to animals like that. It just simply breaks my heart. So it's incredible the progress that you're yeah. making. And the big thing actually is the area here, the Northwest, is not fenced off. It's a big open area, about 25,000 square kilometers that we have to cover. And it's within the communities. And we must remember, this is the only place in the whole world where you get free roaming black rhinos in a desert. It's actually a desert. And they are special adapted to the desert. And they can make good survival. If it rains and if it's, if there's enough food, the population here just pop. I mean, we had so many calves, we had so many survivals, and that has been shown in the past from where we had only 60 animals in the 80s and where we had 200 some odd animals in the 90s and 2000s, actually. So it's very harsh, it's very dry, it's tough, but these animals are made to be here. The communities, actually, that's living with this wildlife are the most important part of conservation in our area. If you don't have the backup of the communities within a conservation area, then you must as well pack and go and forget about conservation because that's the end. If they decided to help the poachers, you don't have any control over because they know all the ins and outs of the area. They have been in the area for lots of years. Even some of our guys that's working for us, or most of them actually passed away, have been poachers. They killed rhinos, but they didn't poach them to sell the horns, no. They just killed them for the bulk of the meat because they had big families to feed. So you go out and you found a kudu. You kill the kudu, it's maybe five guys. Now you have to share this meat between five guys for five families. And on the way, they will find a big monster Redosta bulls, rhino bulls standing there. So they decided to kill it, throw the head away, share the meat. They had enough meat. But even though these people actually become the guardians of these rhinos, and they were the best. And they actually taught us and tell us, actually, that we poached these animals because we didn't know the value of these animals. We just knew it was rhinos, and they were there, and they had meat, and we needed meat. So we poached them for the meat. We throw the heads away with the horns because we didn't have any business with it. But today we know what it means, what the value of these animals are to us as a community. Today, through rhino trekking tourism, communities can benefit. Through tourism that comes to look for these rhinos, communities can benefit. And that actually has been shown with this lockdown and this corona outbreak, 
where tourism actually stopped. And a lot of our communities were suffering. There was no income for them from tourism, which is the biggest income for them. So those communities are the biggest assets we have to work with to protect this wildlife. And on the other hand, I am also working with the traditional authorities. By the way, I am also a headman of this one group. So me and another gentleman called John Kasauna working for IRDNC, who is the director, have actually come up with the idea of pulling together all the traditional authorities from different areas and talk to them about conservation, about protecting rhinos, about the value of the rhino in our regions, how they can benefit. And they understand it. And the traditional authorities, the chiefs and the headmen and the councillors, they are the custodians of this freehold land, the communal land. And communities listen better to them than anyone else because they are the lawmakers and they actually bring the law down to the communities and they've got all the rights to work with the communities. That leads us nicely, Simpson, to talk about Tusk and the Tusk Awards, because when Tusk started 30 years ago, they were very different, I think, on the conservation landscape. And one of the great things they did was realise early on the value and how essential it is to bring the local communities in and get their support. And that's the impression I get that Tusk were very quick to realise that, the importance of community and getting everybody on board Just tell us how proud you were to receive that award from Prince William at the Tusk Awards and to bring it home to Namibia. I would thank my communities. It's because of them. They always told me that what you are doing is a great job for the nation. You don't do it for yourself. I was really very excited when I had my first email and I saw you win the Prince William Tusk Award. I didn't actually read it myself. One of my colleagues, which is my chief operations officer, one evening came to me and he said, did you read something in your emails? I said, no, you won the task award. I said, wow, my face just dropped and I was gray of excitement. And really, since then, I I realized how important this work was that I was doing and how important it was to work with the communities, with the traditional authorities, with the governments, with the politicians and with my own people. I mean, when I received this award, actually, before I knew what was going around me, the whole news was already in Namibia. (laughs) Everybody knew about it. They had already photos of me and the Prince William standing there on the stage. It went so fast. And I was like, my phone was sometimes ringing. Sometimes it was just messages coming in. For those two, three days, my phone actually didn't stop working. (laughs) <laughs> so, and I was really excited because it's people that some of them that I never knew that actually support me or that are behind me with the work that I'm doing were actually congratulating me. And I was very excited and very proud that I could bring back this trophy to Namibia this year. And that again actually shows me that we always say that in conservation, Namibia is very high. I think it's a second on the list when it comes to tourism and conservation. And that actually shows me, with me winning this trophy, that Namibia is really a success story in conservation. It certainly is a success story in conservation. You've met His Royal Highness in Africa. The Duke told me a bit about your experience together in Namibia, but will you tell us in your words, Simpson, what you did when Prince William came out to go rhino tracking with you? The first thing was when they planned for Prince William to come out, I had a meeting with Charlie and from Tusk and, and we discussed how we wanted to do it. I said, okay, I'll be waiting for him in the field where I'm working. When that moment came, actually, the aeroplane lands, he came off, he greets me. It was actually the second time that we met in person. So we know each other already. And I think that's the one reason why he wants me to actually guide him in the field. But it was an experience for him to walk in the desert for more than two kilometers on foot and finding a rhino and only seeing it for 30 seconds and it just disappeared there in the desert. It it was really exciting. And I think he must have realized how hard it is. And for these guys that are doing all this hard work, tracking these rhinos day by day, year by year, and found them. I mean, they follow it early from six o'clock in the morning. And we were there, we found it at around 12 o'clock. And so... He was really excited and he was very happy that he could meet the guys in the field 
on the ground, the people that are really doing the work on the ground and experience a bit of how to track and learn some things about what the rhino is eating, when do you know that this rhino is, the spore is fresh and those kind of things. So we explained all these kind of things to him and he was very eager to know, I mean, how we know this and, and all kinds of things. So it was a very special three, four hour journey for me with him in the Namibian desert. He joked at the awards actually behind the scenes that he only got 30 seconds, but he said that 30 seconds was absolutely magical to actually see the rhino. Yeah. I mean, it was like I show him this, the rhino, the age standing there, and he was like, wow, and then he turned around and just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny, but it was also fun. And we were looking around and the guys were like, all of them were down. It's just the two of us that were standing there and watching this animal. But it was so quick, but fun. I'm sure it was. Well, we've got a little bit of our special moment backstage with His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cambridge. How do you feel about the judges choosing Simpson as the winner of the Prince William Tusk Award? Oh, well, I'm obviously deeply thrilled and honoured and proud that Simpson's got chosen. I mean, he was, I, I met him a few years ago and uh, I, you can have a certain eye for people and you think he's got to win one day. And I'm so glad that the judges have deemed this year to be the fit year that, um, that Simpson wins. I think he's done a phenomenal job and I'm, I'm just so pleased for him. I know that Tusk is one of your very first patronages. How much, uh, sir, do these awards mean to you? Something about Tusk really caught my eye and it was particularly at the time around the need for conservation models. Um, and what Tusk had done was work very closely and very brilliantly with community conservation. The idea being that if you don't buy the locals into protecting a species, then you're not going to win. And Tusk was at the forefront of that back when conservation was still going through a period of reflection and modernization. Your Royal Highness, I know you have to go, but I gather Simpson is in the wings. Here he is. How much does this mean to you that you've spent time with Prince William and here you are holding this very special award tonight? This is the putting of my life, I would say, it, as a conservationist. I mean, I, I've seen my value now, so it means a lot for me receiving this award. Oh, it's a very special moment. We're very proud of you, Simpson. That's we will you let you go, sir. Thank you very much. Not and I'll all. carry on with Simpson. Simpson, on the night, you talked about how the award fund will help you because it's been a struggle, hasn't it, during the pandemic. What difference will the fund that comes with the award make? I think that fund will make a big difference in my work, my life and all. Because most of the fund will be going towards the increment of my staff salaries. And then I'll take some of the funds and use it for the security operations that we're doing. And also for the traditional authority trips that we're doing, to getting the traditional authorities together. And maybe we were thinking of building a small center in the central area of the Rhino Range where we can meet and where everybody can meet. It's on the tourist road. People can come in there. We can, people can talk to them. We can talk to them. I will join them sometimes on, on special occasions and I will give talks. So it will bring a difference in the whole area with my staff, with the traditional authorities and with everybody that's working in the area. And it's not just Prince William who thinks you do an incredible job. We've got a clip of Maxi Lewis, director of the Namibian Association CBNRM support organisations, speaking about you in the awards film. Samson is a very passionate person, um, very dedicated to his work, has a lot of skills and experience working in the field. He's not just a CEO that sits in an office and gives instruction. He's a CEO that goes out in the field and gets his hands dirty. And it's still important, Simpson, isn't it, for you to be out in the field with your teams and, as Maxi said, get your hands dirty? Yeah, I think it's very important. I mean, I grow up with these people. We eat out of the same pot, we drink out of the same cup. And for them to know that I have become sort of their CEO is a very good thing. But in my mind, I think... I don't want to cut myself out or off from these people and let them stay there and I stay in the other side. No, until the last minute of my life in the trust where I'm working, I will be with my staff. Very difficult. Sometimes I don't see some of them for even three months, but I try my utmost to go out to the field, meet the ones I can meet and always try and meet the other ones. That's actually how I build their morale up and talk to them, make jokes and sleep with them in the field and things like that. And that keeps them going. Because if the CEO can come out 
and sleep with us in the field and do rhino trekking still with us. Why can't we work? I just encourage them all the time to do the work and be with them and see their happy faces. They see my face making jokes with them and so on. So it's really good. Let's also hear from Pete Beitel, Principal Conservation Scientist at the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, Namibia. Simpson is a very soft-spoken, gentle giant, if I might call him. He's quite a big man. He's also a, a, a community leader for the entire country. Everyone knows Simpson. People in the community look up to him. He is the face of Save the Rhino Trust. Without him, I don't think we would have had the success in that population as we do have now. Simpson, they're clearly both very proud of you. I'm just wondering how your family feels about your work. You told me when you were in London that sometimes you've been away for many weeks or months on end and you truly have dedicated your life to saving Rhino. So how do your children and your wife feel about what you do? In the first place, my wife, from day one, we were together and she knows when I said I'm going now to the field, I'm going to protect the rhinos. She was alone for years. But then we had our firstborn, and then six years later, we had our secondborn. Firstborn grew up with me in the vehicle. I took him out to the field when he stopped breastfeeding about three years. Since then, I started teaching him how to do things. And, and then when he went to school, the little one was again about that age. So I took him again with me. And so they know exactly what I'm doing, and they understand what I'm doing. I've made them to understand the value of my work, and they are really happy. And if times come, I take the whole family out and take them to the areas where I'm working, showing them this is where I'm working. This is what I'm doing. This is the people I'm working with. And even visit the communities and show them this is my wife, this is my two boys, and we enjoy it. So I have been away for days, weeks, months, and even a year when I studied in the UK. But the love that's there and the support that I'm receiving from my wife is always there. That sounds truly wonderful. I mean, Simpson, can you give me a sense of you growing up? You've given a, painted a beautiful picture of your sons there and coming out with you from when they were young. What was your family life like? What was it like growing up for you? I grew up with my grandmother and grandfather, actually. And they were farmers. They had cattle and goats. And I was one of the guys that was looking after them. So it's, it's how I actually came to love animals. And then when I moved to high school, I changed direction and do something else. But then I always had my passion in in conservation. So I didn't have the chance before independence to get into conservation. But after independence, I had the chance and I decided now I'll do it and I will do my best. Simpson, some of what you do, I would imagine over the years, is probably dangerous. As you said, you're dealing with wild animals and you never know quite what the situation is. Have you had any hairy moments there out in the field? You described your first one where you escaped up a tree when the rhino charged, but have there been any frightening moments? There were actually so many. The one time I was on my own, and that's when I was working with the elephants. And I was following this elephant bull. He was working, I was working behind him, maybe 20 meters away from him. He knew I was there. I really wanted him to turn around so that I could see his ear notches. So I was following him. I parked the car away, away. And as he was walking, suddenly this bull just turned around. But he turned around and stopped. So I turned around and ran. (laughs) And I was running like no one's business until I got to the car. And then I turned around and looked at it. The elephant was still standing and watching me. And I bumped into the car and fall down on the ground. And I was like, yeah. I laughed at myself because it was so funny. This guy just turned around and I ran off. But I had other moments, even with rhinos, where I had to jump into a euphobia. Now, a euphobia tree is one of those poisonous bush in the desert. Is it? Those gray ones. Yeah. Yeah, they are poisonous. I mean, they are very poisonous. It's only rhinos, elephants, ground squirrels, kudus, and I think damarat and stinbok that eats them because their digestive system is designed to observe all this poison but it's poisonous even if, if the milk drops on your skin it burns it open but i mean when there's rhino calf it was a sub adult calf and those ones are usually sometimes a little bit dangerous so he came full steam for me i had to jump into the tree and i saved my life by doing this he actually stopped and then he turned around and he ran off but i was like whoa i came out of the tree and then I sat next to the tree and i, I relaxed there until I was fine and then I walked off again. And I had so many of these occasions with rhinos. 
but it was fun. And then you, we were always making jokes and we said, oh, these poor animals, I try to protect them and try to kill me. They don't <laughs> understand me, but they will never understand me. But I have to do what I'm doing to protect them. What drives you, Simpson? I love the, I love your smile. I love the way you laugh. I love the way you describe everything as fun. But what is it that drives your spirit to continue until your dying day doing what you're doing? The support of my family and the support of my staff that I'm working with, other people within the communities. Whenever they see me, they will say, oh, there comes Simpson. It's a rhino man. That actually makes me to feel so proud of myself my people and everybody. And I was really very proud to have my wife with me in London, sitting there, watching me, giving my speech, receiving my trophy from Prince William, she meeting Prince William. I mean, if it wasn't for me working so hard, she support me. And if, if it wasn't for her supporting me, I would never receive this. And also the communities and my staff who always say, CEO, you're doing well. Thank you. That's really good to hear. And of course, Simpson, as His Royal Highness said on that evening in London, Africa plays such a vital role in the natural world. How worried are you about climate change and the effect that climate change is having on the communities and also on the rhino's habitat? Very worrying. Climate change is very worrying. I can only see disasters. If the habitat, the rhino habitat, if it's going through disasters and if there is no food, that will be the end of the rhinos. And also the communities, if they suffer, they will also start with killing wildlife for food. Climate change, I don't want to really hear about it. I only want to hear about good climate change, but not what is going on now or what has started now. So I hope this will change in future. Otherwise, we don't really have a future for our generations to come. Something you touched on in your speech when we were at the awards together was how hopeful you are that the younger generation will continue your work and rise to the challenge. You're doing a lot of youth work out there now, aren't you, Simpson? I can only say they are the future leaders. And if they don't want to pull their socks up now and listen to us and play with us the games that we are playing, then I don't see the future. And therefore, it's important for us, who's got the capacity now to build their new career for them or awareness for them, to be able to know and understand what we are doing is for them and for their future. I strongly advise people to take younger generations on the hands and if they can, show them the way. And as I'm doing always, like, we do have a awareness campaign program in Save the Rhino Trust itself where we had a, a official that's going out and talking to the youth, take them out, show them the rhinos, the value of the rhinos, how to protect them, to build them up slowly. And one day, like somebody said to me just the day before, just the day when we had a big meeting and when we came out from the meeting, somebody said to me, all the youth that was with me at that day when you win the award say they want to become a Samsung. And that's very good. Then I know there are future leaders that will be able to do what I'm doing. And the future of the rhinos and all the other wildlife will be secured. Simpson, what would you say to your two boys if one day they turn around to you and say, Dad, we want to follow in your footsteps. We want to be a Simpson. You know, they have done this already. They are doing different things, but I know their hearts are still there. I can only see them going out every now and then and do field work. Their hearts are there. I have laid the foundation for them. And I think they will be following also. We are thousands of miles away from you here in Britain. I know you know Britain well. You studied here at one point in your career. But how, Simpson, can we help? What difference can we make? I always say to people, for those who can't actually come and be with us in the field to protect these animals, their help and support will be through funding us to do the work. You know, we are in Africa. There is no real big money here in Africa that we can use for this conservation and things like that. So we will only pledge to these people in the UK who cares for the wildlife and who cares for the people in Africa to support us through funding that we will be able to do what we are doing to the 
best of our abilities. Simpson, I hope that 2022 is a good year for you and your teams in the field. I'm sending you all the best from the UK. I knew when I met you that I had to get to know you a little bit better and really find out more about who you are and what you do. We are so lucky to have conservationists like you. So she says, I did get choked up on the night actually at the end of the programme, but I do feel a bit choked up because I think we're very lucky to have people like you. So a massive thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. And I thank all the support, all our supporters. And a big thank to Charlie to make all this happen. And also a big thank to Prince William for accommodating us in Britain and make us feel safe and free. And thank you for you all have done for us while we were there. Thank you. Simpson was referring there to Charlie. He's the founder and CEO of Tusk. You've been listening to Simpson Urikob, CEO of Save the Rhino Trust Namibia and winner of the Prince William Lifetime Conservation Award for Tusk. If you want to see more of Simpson's fantastic work, then do go to tuskawards.com and take a look at our special hour-long programme, Behind the Scenes at the Awards, which features films of Simpson and four other incredible conservation heroes from Africa as well as Prince William's speech and our backstage interviews. You can find a link, it's so easy to do, at tuskawards.com. Over the holidays, download our series of more than 75 inspiring podcasts at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher or wherever you get yours. I'll be back in the new year with more fantastic guests, so bye for now. 